The purpose of this lesson is to learn about constructors, destructors, inheritance, terminology related to inheritance, accessing private members of a parent class, overriding base class methods, how constructors are called during inheritance, the concept that a derived class is an is an instance of a base class, and how to use inheritance to achieve good software design. We used constructors in a prior lesson, and you may not have realized that you're actually doing it, but what's going on is behind the scenes, when we created a new object, every time we created a new instance of that object, it had to copy our template. So what happened is it took our class object, the parent class, the one that was our blueprint for creating another object, it used that to actually build another instance of that particular object so that we had a new card for that object with the title on the top, and we had all of the attributes and methods that were available to the parent class. All right, so what happens is we're going to use this so that we can encapsulate data and methods to provide a way of hiding data and hiding methods for performing functions from other sections of code. It also allows us to do things like keeping track of somebody's name, friend name, telephone number, things of that nature, without having to use arrays. Whenever we play with class objects, we have the same type of ability that we have with the array as far as storing large amounts of data, but in this case, we don't have to try to keep multiple arrays aligned and try to figure out which one belongs to which. All right, so whenever we create a new class object, we have this thing called a constructor that occurs. And a constructor is simply a section of code that runs that decides how the new object should be created. And so it's going to establish the name of the object. It will establish uh, the memory for it. It will also establish things like all of the attributes that are to be used. Remember, every one of our attributes is a variable, so that's a named place in memory. And by default, most of our operating, I'm sorry, programming languages will automatically create this for us. Now, what happens, though, is that sometimes we may not want to use the automatically declared one, and we can actually make our own uh, constructors. So in this example here, they show you that we have a, an object called employee, and the uh, constructor establishes one employee instance. And then, depending on the language, it may provide initial values for all of the data fields. So if we have attributes there, it could do things like provide zeros for all of the numerical values if we don't actually specify one. Or it could provide nulls. If it's a text string, it may provide it with simply a, uh, an empty uh, double quote. So it just depends on what, what language we're using as to what the initial value is going to be. It's going to be up to us, though, to change the values. And we can either do that by um, allowing the system to create these default values, and we just simply allow the system to automatically pick whichever one it wants, or we could actually pick our own default value. So if let's say we want to create an employee, and for every employee that gets created, we want their initial uh, pay rate to be $7.50 an hour, we can actually do that, and we can specify it in the constructor. And what that does is it means that if we create a new employee and we don't specify a value for their pay rate, it will automatically make their pay rate $7.50. We can also use a constructor to perform additional tasks. So let's say if we create a new object and we need for it to do something else when that object is created, so we need to kick off some other method, we are going to use our own constructor to be able to do that kind of stuff. Now the thing is, is that our constructor is going to be the same name as our actual class so the blueprint it would have the same name. And what this allows us to do is we can actually even overload these. To create one of these, we are going to have to place it inside of the class and then outside of any other method. So it'll look like this. We have a class object called employee in this case. We have declarations for our attributes. And then you'll see here that we have a method. It's called public employee. And you'll notice this is the same name. And what this is, is this will allow us to decide what happens when this object gets created, when it gets constructed. Now in this case, if somebody creates a new employee, it will automatically run this method here, and it will set the hourly wage to $10, which means that whatever the method is for setting the hourly wage down here, we pass in $10, and we set the hourly wage to that. Now we could do other things. Let's say we want to make something on the screen that says, oh, a new object has been created. We can do that. And the whole purpose of the constructor is that we can override these default values that normally would be created, or we can get it to do something else if we need it to.
All right, so in this case, we have another program where we declare two employees, and we have a declaration for an employee called My Personal Trainer and another employee called My Interior Decorator. Now, this is the pseudocode for creating this new one. In Raptor, we did the uh, employee, um, sorry, My Personal Trainer equals new employee, and that would allow us to create a new type of employee and call it My Personal Trainer, but in the pseudocode, we just simply write the class type and then a space, and then what do we want to call it? And then here you notice we have output trainer's wage, my personal trainer dot get hourly wage, and it will go and get the hourly wage. Now we didn't set anything, but by doing this where we set the hourly wage as $10 here, then what we're doing is we're telling the system, hey, if we don't pass in a value, if we don't override the value that's there already, let's go ahead and make the default value $10. So you'll notice that both of these people, when we do the my interior decorator dot get hourly wage, both of these went up with $10 an hour. Now we can also pass parameters into it. So I could make a constructor that allows us to send in some initial value that's different than whatever the constructor actually has. So let's say in this case I want to create a, an employee and we're going to allow somebody to pass in the value when they actually create the employee. Then we will allow the system to automatically create this and set these initial values. Now we did this in a prior lesson where we created our actors and we, uh, we created a constructor with their first name, last name, and so forth. What we were actually creating was this section of code right here, which is simply stating that if somebody were to create a new actor and they pass in certain values in a certain order, then we're going to allow the system to automatically set those values for us. We don't have to specify each one. All right, we can overload these, which is actually what we were doing without realizing it. Um, you were actually going to send in data, and the data that we send in gets sent in as the first name, last name, and their age. And when we pass those in, it says, oh, hey, there's a method out here that allows for this, this overloaded method. And so we're going to allow it to accept that type of data and create that or uh, run that method. Now, if we don't pass those three values in, in the actor example, then there's no other method that matches, so it just simply ignores it, and it, it just creates the object with all blank values. All right, so in this case here, what we do is we create a, sorry, let's go back. We create an employee, and we allow somebody to pass in the, um, the pay rate. And so let's say I make a new employee, and I say something like um, employee dot, uh, I'm sorry, whatever the employee's name is, um, public employee or whatever we want to call it, and make it as a new instance of employee, and we pass in $3 or $10, let's give them a good salary, um, pass in $10, then what it will do is take the value that we pass in, and it will set the hourly wage. However, in this one here, if we don't pass any values, it will still set the value to $10. All right, so what happens is if I, uh, if I pass a value in, and we say something like employee delivery person. Well, this is a standard employee. We didn't specify a value, so therefore their value is going to be $10. But if we do something like this, where we say employee my butler is $25.85, then there's an overloaded method here that says, okay, if a number comes in, then let's run this one. We'll call it rate, and then we'll set the hourly, hourly wage to rate. Whenever we have an object that gets created, it is just simply a namespace in memory. So what happens is when a program is done running, it always has to do what's called garbage collection, which is it has to go through and remove all of the things that have been created. Now, most of our programming languages, especially C Sharp, do a really good job in garbage collection. Some of them do not. And what that means is that there's a possibility that if I run a program that was created and used objects, and then the program exits, there's a possibility that the program may still be tying up some memory. And the reason for it is, is because that program, when it creates objects, it allocates space and memory to hold those objects. So when we're done, we have to deconstruct them, which just simply means to remove them from memory. All right, now we're not actually removing them from memory because we'd have to overwrite memory with something else. But in this case, all we're doing is telling the system, hey, this memory space is now available. And the way that we do this is we're going to create the same class type declaration, but instead of just simply stating the name, we're going to put a tilde in front of it. And the tilde is on the key to the left of your one key on your keyboard. It's a shift and then that uh, key on the left. All right, but what happens is we can't provide any, math, uh, any arguments. We cannot overload it and there's no return type. 
But what this would do for us is, in this case, we have a public and then tilde student. This is the destructor for it. Then what we can do is we can state things like, oh, this object has been destroyed. And so if I create a new actor and I create actor one, actor two, actor three, and then I decide that actor one no longer exists, then what we can do is we can destruct actor one. And then the system will tell us, oh, hey, actor one was, was destroyed. All right, so the question is, where do I really need to use this? If I am interfacing with a database, especially if I'm using SQL, then what happens is I have to make a connection to the database. And what will happen is if I try to load data into the database from an object, or I take data from the database and load it into my object, then my connection has to stay open. And the question is, when does my connection end? Well, my connection is going to end when my object no longer needs data from it or when my object no longer exists. All right, so if I'm going to make a connection to a database, I need to close that connection to the database somehow. Well, how's that going to happen? Through a destructor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to state that, all right, this object no longer exists, therefore close the connection to the database. All right, so then we have this thing called inheritance. So we created these things called attributes. We created method, uh, methods. We have the accessor and mutator methods. And what we have are just simply things that describe a particular item. But what you'll have sometimes is you'll have things like, let's say I made a class called car and a class called truck and a class called motorcycle. Well, they all have things that are in common. They all have tires. They all have engines. They all have... Um, fuel tank. They all have some sort of throttle. And they all have methods like um, accelerate, decelerate, um, turn on, turn off, things of that nature. So what happens is if I create these different class objects, there's a possibility of me wasting a lot of resources by retyping code that I don't necessarily need. So instead of declaring them all separately, what I might want to do is something more along the lines of just simply a generic automobile. All right, so what happens is I can state that every automobile has tires, and every automobile has an engine, and every automobile has um, an engine size, and every automobile has um, a throttle, and every engine automobile has uh, an ignition. And then every automobile has th something like accelerate and decelerate and um, fill the tank or things like that. So all of my auto automobiles will have that. But if I talk about a car and a motorcycle, a motorcycle doesn't have any doors, but a car does. So a car is still an automobile, and a motorcycle is still an automobile, but the car also has doors. And the uh, car may also have a trunk, and a car would have a hood and things of that nature. So what happens is we can use inheritance. Now inheritance says we're going to create some what's called a parent class or a super class. And what this is is just going to be our topmost level in our hierarchy of the um, of all the attributes for these things. And I can say that we have this thing called automobile. And then I can branch off from there and I can say that we also have these things called cars. And we have these things called trucks. And we have these things called motorcycles. All the stuff that they have in common would be declared in the automobile class. The things that are different would be declared with, within their class. So what this allows us to do is it allows us to share different attributes and methods among multiple classes, but we also can add to that if we need to. All right, so in this case here, we have this thing called a customer. This is our class object, which has an ID number and a purchase total. It has a method for setting the ID number. It has a method for getting the ID number. It has a method for setting the purchase total and for getting the purchase total. All right, so we have these, this class of things called customers. Now, what happens is in some of your stores, you'll have a, uh, another class of people called preferred customers, which is declared in this next one. All right, so my customers have the ID number, purchase total, setting and getting the ID number, the purchase total. But if we're a preferred customer, then they also get a discount. Now, this preferred customer is still a customer, so they still have an ID number. They still have a purchase total. But on top of that, then they also have this discount rate, and then we can set and get the discount rate. So if I were to actually declare a regular customer, then I would see that that customer has two attributes. If I declared a preferred customer, this person would actually get three attributes. They have discount rate and purchase total ID number. So whatever is declared in the parent object 
is still going to be declared for the child objects, but this other attribute here will also be declared for it. Alright, so some of the benefits are that we don't have to try to recreate everything. We don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we write a program. What this does for me is that I can reuse sections of code that allow me to declare things like automobiles and people and pets and animals and things of that nature. And what it allows me to do is it allows me to kind of make my code a little bit more concise, but I can branch out from there. I can add things to it. It makes our program a little bit easier to read and write, a little bit easier to understand, and it also has the ability to make us less prone to making errors. All right, so we need to understand some terms. Some things that we have are the uh, base class. That's going to be our, our parent class, our automobile, the topmost level. Then you have these things called derived classes, and these are things like our child objects, like the car and the truck, that inherit uh, properties from the base class. All right, so then you have a super class and a subclass, and then parent class and child class. Those are all synonyms for the same thing. So the super class would be the automobile. The subclass would be car, and subclass would be truck. Parent class, that would be automobile. Child class would be car and truck. So they're just different words for the same thing, but really what it is is the base class is the topmost level. That's all the thing that's shared with all the other classes. And then our derived classes are all the child classes that can add on to that. All right, so we need to discover which one of our classes is the base and which ones are derived. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use this method where we can say the names together, and then we're going to be more generalized and then we're going to be more specific. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to have this more specific name first, and then we're going to look at our more generic. All right, so what we can do is we can take a derived class, and we can even break it down further. And what we end up with this thing is called ancestors, and ancestors is just simply an entire list of parent classes. All right, so you end up with something like this, where we have this base class called object, and then we have, um, we have this object, we have an animal, which is a child object of object. And then we have domestic pet, which is a derived class of animal. And then we have these things called dogs and cats. All right, so now we look at dogs and cats, and then we can look at this where we have for different types of dogs. We have poodle, Great Dane, uh, my poodle, your poodle, and so forth. So we can break it down from one class level to the next, and we can add more uh, attributes and more methods with each level as we go along. All right, so in this case here, we have a class called Customer Demo. We have some attributes where we have um, our customer, Customer 1, and we have a preferred customer, Customer 2. All right, so Customer 1 is just a regular customer. It doesn't get a discount. Customer 2 is preferred, so he does get a discount. All right, so Customer number 1, we set the ID number, and Customer number 1, we set the purchase total, $700. But Customer number 2, we also set the ID number, and we set the purchase total, but we also can set the discount rate. And now for this particular person, we can actually set a discount rate. And when we do set that, then we're also able to get it. So notice that we have the, um, the regular customer only has an ID and a purchase total. Our preferred customer has the ID, purchase total, and a discount. All right, so our child class is going to contain all the data fields and methods of the parent. So if we have an attribute called uh, ID name or ID number, then the parent and the child class will, will both actually have that. Now, in the child class, we didn't declare it, but because it knows that it gets it from the parent class, it will also show up there. All right, so what happens here is uh, we need to have ways to access the data that is stored in our classes. Now, the methods are public, but the data is often going to be private. We talked about that last time, where we don't want somebody to be able to directly manipulate our attributes, but we need to give them some way to set and get those values, so we're going to give them a public method. All right, so in this case here, um, they're trying to show you not to do this, but they have a, um, a method for setting the, the discount rate, and saying take the rate and set it equal to discount rate, and then try to perform some sort of function and return it. And in this case, we can't really do this because um, the field called um, discount rate is not going to be accessible to any child class objects. So what happens is now if I create a new class, uh, child class to try to uh, calculate the discount, 
the child class can't see it because even though it inherits the attributes, it will not inherit the values that are declared for those. All right, so we have this thing called protected access, and protected access is just simply stating that nothing outside of the particular class is going to be able to see the data that is there. All right, so they, they show you here that if I were in a parent class and we have public fields and methods, other classes outside of it may be able to call these uh, fields and methods directly. And now that's only if I make them as public. Child classes will be able to access this data. If I declare something in here as being protected, then what happens is outside classes cannot look at any of these values, but child classes can. Anything that I declare as private, where we use the actual keyword private, anything that is private is going to be blocked from anybody else. So our child class, classes can't look at it and outside classes can't look at it. So what we need to look at is do we want things to be public, do we want them to be protected, or do we want them to be private? Now we want to use the most restrictive that we can, but we need to make sure that if we go too restrictive that our child class objects can still see the data that we need. All right, so the way that this works is we actually use the, uh, the keyword called protected. And so instead of saying private or public, we would just simply say protected. And in this case, we have a protected number of data type called purchase total. And then what this would do is it would allow any child class objects to be able to look at the value of purchase total. But another class would not be able to see this. So anything that was derived from this particular parent, those could see those values. But any other class that's outside of this that has not been derived from this parent cannot see those values. All right, so when we have our declaration here, then we have uh, purchases equal get purchase total. All right, so the question is, where does that come from? And we have our get purchase total here returns purchase total, which gives us back this value here. The only reason that this is allowed is because of this protected keyword. If I did not include the word protected, it would assume that it's private. And if it were private, this class and this subclass that inherits from the customer would not be allowed to see the methods and attributes of each other. They would have the attribute names, but they wouldn't be able to look and see what the values are for each other. All right, so the question is, why do we want to do this? Okay, so we want to uh, allow public methods so that other people can call our values and they can get the data back and forth. All right, so what will happen is we don't need to worry about our protected access specifiers. We don't need to worry about child versus um, parent classes. We don't need to worry about if the parent or the child has additional protection put in place that one of them can't see each other's values. And if we use the, uh, the public access for these methods, then we actually end up with less errors. It's usually best to use the public method, but in certain instances I may not want somebody, somebody else to be able to look directly at my class, and in those cases I'm going to use protected. I can always override methods in a parent class. And what I mean by that is, in this case here, we have a class called student and another class called scholarship student. Now, these are the same type of people except that one, they have one difference. Um, a regular student, in this case, is allowed to have a certain number of credit hours, but a scholarship student is allowed to have more credit hours. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to declare that a student has an ID number, billable credits, and a tuition. Those are the attributes. We can set and get the ID number. We can set the credit hours. We can get the credit hours, and we can get their tuition. But if they're on a scholarship, what we can do is we could actually override the value here. We could completely override that method, which means that let's say I want to specify that this person is allowed to have 16 credit hours and this person is only allowed to have 14. We can actually do this where we can create this, this child class and we can specify that they're allowed to have more methods. I'm sorry, more credits. All right, so we could, uh, we could create a special method in the scholarship student. And we could do something like set scholarship student credits, and we could give it a completely different attribute. We could create a method called scholarship student, or we could just simply override the set credits method in the student class. And that's actually going to be our best option because 
I don't have two separate methods to handle the same thing. They're about the same method. We let the system pick which one it needs based on the type of data being passed. All right, so in here, in this case, we're going to declare something. Uh, we're going to have the actual number of credits, which is a private, which means that nobody else can look at this value. But we do have a public method for setting the credits. We're going to allow somebody to pass in a certain number of hours. When they pass in the number of hours, uh, that will get put into actual credits that goes up into here. And then we allow it to do this thing called super.setCredits. Now, super is actually going to be a keyword. And in certain, um, certain languages, we have to know the name of the super or the base class. In some languages, we can use the keyword super. It just depends on the language that, that we're using. But what this does for us is allows us that, let's say I don't want to use my local uh, set credits here. I don't want to do the local one and set it to zero. But up in the parent class, I may want to set it as zero. All right, so in this case, we have um, the student is declared their full-time 15 hours. Um, so that's the full-time amount. Then we have a new student here called a regular student. We have a scholarship student called a scholar. Now remember, a student, a regular student, is going to have all of these attributes and all of these methods. A scholarship student will have all of these attributes and all of these methods. But this particular method here will override the one that came from here. So imagine taking this and sticking it over top of the one that came in the original. So they both end up having the same number of methods. But the method that comes in the parent class for this particular scholarship student gets overridden by the one for scholarship student. All right, so we have regular student has a set ID number 444. The uh, regular student has set credits to full time, which is 15. And then we have uh, a scholar, which is our scholarship student, setting their student ID number to 555. And we're going to set their credits to full time. Now, the thing is, is that we have a method for figuring out how much they should pay. So the get tuition amount here is actually going to be different. So it knows that, okay, well, they're full time and we perform some sort of calculation. Well, if they're full time and a scholarship student, they shouldn't have any tuition. So that one, that's what ended up down here. So the person that owes money is going to be the regular student. They owe $1,500, but the person that's on a scholarship would owe nothing because the method for calculating the tuition for the scholarship student overrides the method for calculating the tuition for regular student. All right, so the, the idea of the constructors is that every time we create a new object, we are going to in, uh, create a new constructor, and that constructor is going to be responsible for creating the object in memory, for creating all of the attributes for it. We need to instantiate an object, and every time we instantiate it, um, we're going to allow it to have what's called the subclasses. And if I want to create a subclass, I'm actually going to be using two different constructors, one for the base class and one for the derived class. The superclass constructor would always execute first. So that way, our, if we're overriding something that's in the base class with a derived class method, we want that to be applied second. All right, so if a superclass has only constructors that require arguments, then any subclass constructors can contain any number of statements. We have to have at least one constructor for each subclass. Now, by default, this would automatically be done unless we need to use something other than the default values. Um, but if we're going to use a constructor for the subclasses, then we have to call the superclass constructor and pass the required arguments to it and allow it to turn around and actually call the subclass constructor. All right, so in this case here, we have a public employee that we pass values into. So we're actually going to overload our constructor. We're going to pass it into some sort of method to create a new employee with a particular ID number and a salary. And then when we pass this in, then it will actually create a, um, the child object here with 999 and 0.0. .0. So what happens is, we're, we're going to create the parent object first. We have to create the parent object called employee, but then our particular employee here, this person is a commission employee. Then we're going to go ahead and declare this person and send their values in instead. All right, so we talk about this being an is an instance of a base class. And what I mean by that is we always talk about the more specific and then we talk about the more general. So if I'm talking about my automobile and my car and my truck and my motorcycle, what I can actually say is 
a uh, car is an automobile. A truck is an automobile. A motorcycle is an automobile. And what we're doing is just simply going from the more specific to the more generic. And what that does is allows us to verify that the objects that we're deriving actually belong to the parent class. It makes it a little bit easier to figure out who the base class is and who the super class is. So if I were just to simply tell you, hey, uh, of these two things, which one is the parent, automobile or car? Well, okay, you say automobile is an car. No, that doesn't make sense. Okay, car is an automobile. That one makes sense. So therefore, car is the child and automobile is the parent. All right, so the whole purpose of this is we want to save our development time because we don't want to have to recreate all of these different class objects. We don't want to have to retest every single time we make a new type of class, but there will be times when we have to override something that is in the class, and that's the whole point of using inheritance is the ability to override or add on to something that exists in our base class. To show you how this works, I'm actually going to design this in Raptor. So what I would like you to do is to create the same program. So I call it Pringle underscore week 11 underscore number one. What I'm going to do is I want to show you the uh, example with the automobile. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare the UML for an automobile. And we're going to call this class of objects automobile. And then we're going to go ahead and create another class here. Now, our other, the next class that we have is going to be car, and then another class that we're going to call truck. Okay, so I have a car, I have a truck, and I have a parent class called automobile. So I'm just moving these around so you can see them. All right, so what I want to do is I'm going to use this, um, this icon right here says inherits from, and I'm going to go from the child object and just click, and then move around up into my parent object. Okay, so now I'm going to do the same thing here. I want to do it again. Same icon with car. So click on car, then click on automobile. And what you will see is that they now both point to the automobile. So they both are types of automobiles. And if I move this, let me see if I can get it to show it a little bit better. Because I want to kind of put this in the middle. All right, it's, it's not going to let me move it around and show you any better. But the automobile is the parent class and our truck and our car are both derived classes. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense being like that, but the whole point is just to see that these two things inherit from automobile. So what I want to do is I'm going to add some things for my automobile. Every automobile is going to have um, an engine size, so let's do something like num engine size, and this is going to be a number here, so I'm going to call this um, in here. It's actually going to be what's called a, a double, which allows me to have what's called a float, uh, floating point number. And so I'm just simply going to make it engine size here. I'm going to have something like uh, num tires, which is going to be an integer value, so that one's okay. And I'm going to have something like um, the color of it. So here we're going to have str color, which is a string, so I have to type that in and now I have my string. All right, so then I'm also going to have some methods for getting and setting those. So I, wanted, I want to uh, set engine size, and that's going to be a void. So I'm going to pass some sort of value in, and remember it's a double here, so I have to specify it's double, and then we'll call it um, and num engine size, and then I'm going to have another one here, which is going to be uh, setting the number of tires. And so that's going to pass in an integer value called num tires. And then I'm going to have another one here for, I'm going to set the color. So we'll make this one set color. And it's going to pass in a string value here, so we'll call this string uh, str color. Okay, so then I also need to get these values back out of it, so we'll make a new, and this one's going to be get engine size. And in this case, we're going to return the double value, so the type here is going to be double. 
and then I need to make another one for uh, getting the number of tires, get number of tires, and it's going to return an integer value. Okay, then we're going to make another one, and we're going to get the color. It's going to retrieve a string value. All right, so that is my UML for the automobile. So I have the uh, engine size, which is a double value, which means it has a decimal place in it. I have the number of tires, which is an integer. And I have the color, which is a string. Then I have a method to set the engine size. Now, it doesn't return anything. We just simply set it. Uh, we have something to set the number of tires, set the color. We can get the engine size, get the number of tires, get the color. And if you notice, my set engine size here doesn't have anything inside of this. For some reason, it did not keep the value that I sent into it. So I'm going to put into here, um, let's see, it was supposed to be, for the engine size, was a double. So I'm going to say double and num engine size. Oops. Okay, so now hopefully it kept it. Yeah, here we go. So now you should see that I have uh, the num engine size. We have the number of tires, a string for the color. We can get the engine size. We can get the number of tires, and we can get the color. All right, so now I have a car and a truck, and the difference between these two is that my truck will also have a bed, and my car will have a trunk size. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make for my truck a value for uh, something like um, num bed length. Okay, and we're just going to let that be an integer value. Okay, so now I have the bed length and I need something to get and set the bed length. So I'm going to set bed length. And what am I setting this is I'm passing in an integer value called uh, num bed length. Okay, and then I want to get the bed length. So I'm going to say get bed length. And I'm going to return a type of integer. And there we go. So now I have my, um, my bed length. I have something to set it, which does have data coming into it. And then I have the ability to get the bed length. All right, my car, though, it doesn't have a bed length. It has um, our trunk capacity. So let's call it that. Maybe it's so many cubic inches or cubic feet. All right, so I'm going to have a value here for um, num trunk. Let's call it trunk capacity. Okay, so we're going to leave it as an integer. It could be a double. All right, so now we need to get and set that. So we're going to set trunk capacity. And we're going to allow somebody to pass in an integer value, which we'll call num trunk capacity. And then another one to be able to get it. So we'll get trunk capacity. And what am I getting? Well, I'm getting an integer value. And there we go. So now I have something to set the trunk size, something to get the trunk size, and I have something to hold the trunk size. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm, I'm declaring that I'm making objects that are a car and an object that is a truck that are both still automobiles. And what I want to show to you is that these will both inherit the attributes and methods from the automobile. So we're going to make part of the program. The rest of it will function just like before. But what I'm really interested in you seeing is just simply the inheritance of the methods for getting and setting those attributes and for the attributes themselves. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare a truck and a car. And so I'm going to call this... Uh, car1, and I'm going to set this to a new car. And then I have truck1, and I'm going to set this to a new truck. And what this will do is it will know that I have this thing called a car, and I have this thing called a truck, and these are subclass objects of automobile, so when I make a new car, it will get these values, but it will also get all of these up here. All right, so watch what happens when I try to run this, and I make the new car. It will automatically allocate memory for the class automobile, the class car, and the class truck, so the blueprints get stored in memory. And then when I make my new car, it makes a new memory location for the car, 
And when I expand this, you will see that I have the trunk capacity, the engine size, the number of tires, and the color. My truck, when I do it, it will, it will also have the engine size, the tires, and the color, just like the car did, because they inherited those, but my truck will also have the bed length. So the whole purpose of this inheritance is that I can actually create my, my super class, my parent class, that has all of the things that are in common in all of my, uh, my derived classes, make all of those things that are in common there, and then the things that are not in common, then we actually declare those in the derived classes. All right, so this is not a complete program. What I would like for you to do is I would like for you to complete this. So you're going to do all of your sets and gets, just like you did in last week's lessons, for the automobile, for the car, and the truck. And you notice with the automobile here that you have the engine size, the number of tires, and the color. So you'll have methods for setting and getting each of those. The car only has the trunk size. So the trunk capacity here, we have to set and get the trunk capacity. The truck has only the bed size, the bed length, so you have to set and get the bed length. What I want you to do is I want you to complete this. So make a car, make a truck, and I would like you to set the values for each of these for one car and one truck just to see that these work. So go ahead and call it your last name underscore uh, W11 underscore N1. This is the only one for this week. I want you to go ahead and complete this just so you can see what it looks like if you actually declare these and use them as the derived classes. In this lesson, you learn that a constructor is a method that establishes an object. We have the default constructors that are created automatically by the compiler that can have default values in them. We could create them ourselves. They're going to have the same name as the class it constructs. It does not return any type, but it can have arguments. So we can send things to it and set initial values. You learn that a destructor is something that will remove the object once we no longer need it. And then we can also do things like state something back to the console, or we can give a message to the user, or we can close a connection to a database, or whatever else we have open at that time. And the way that we do that is through the destructor method. Inheritance allows us to create our, our generic class of objects, like automobile, and then we can also make our child classes or our derived classes. And then we can add to the capabilities of our base class. So we can add new uh, attributes. We can modify an existing attribute. Or we can actually completely override the methods that are available to us. The base class is the parent class. That's going to be our topmost class. That's our generic. Our derived class is going to be the class that inherits from the base class. We have this relationship between the two of them, the parent and child. So the base is the parent, the derived is the child, and we can also call those super and subclass. Private data fields do not allow anybody else to access our, our attributes. Sometimes we need to use protected. We could always use the public method, but that may not necessarily be the most secure. We are able to override our methods from a child class to a parent class. Uh, however, if we are trying to actually access the data from the parent class, we cannot do that. We have to override it. We can actually instantiate subclass objects. We're going to call two different constructors, one for the base and one for the derived class. Remember, the base class always gets declared first, then the derived classes, so that way we can override things in the base class. The derived class, we can always state it as being a is a particular type of object of our generic base class. We're going to use inheritance to reduce development testing time, make more reliable code, and make it easier for somebody else to actually use our code.